Welcome, this is my summary of learning. My name is Webster Fox, and this is for ECS 210, the depth of curriculum is what I have named this. So it all started in September when we first entered the class, and we got asked, what is your definition of curriculum? What is curriculum to you? And this came straight from my notes from that first day. It's the formal curriculum. That's what we all kind of brushed around. Some of us kind of thought, oh, hey, it's going to be a trick question. And we kind of threw in some little points there and there. But the formal curriculum is the biggest point we all had. It's a set of documents issued by the government, the framework for education and instruction, the direction for learning and the truth and nothing but the truth, which is sadly not the truth. <laughs> but the idea is that you don't avoid the formal curriculum. You have to follow this. This is your essentially foundation as a teacher. And if you don't follow this, you're not going to be in big trouble. But it's not the only part of curriculum. There is the null curriculum. There's the hitting curriculum. There's all sorts of aspects. So my idea is that curriculum isn't just what we teach. It's the entire interconnection of differences between students, teachers, and knowledge. It's the connection and the relations between knowledge teacher, teacher student, student knowledge. And that goes in all directions. That's a cyclic process. It's not just a simple direction in a linear line. One of the biggest things that affect that curriculum though is common sense. And that's because common sense is local. It's reality is that it is your subconscious, what you fall back on. Fight or flight mode is something we talk about sometimes with teachers and how they fall back on their foundations and their fundamental values. Well, that tends to be rooted in what their original experiences in education were when they went to school. And that's based in this common sense idea. It's whatever society thought was common sense at the time. So this is a local concept. It's the subconsciousness, and it allows us to essentially unsee what we don't want to see. Because if we just talk about what's commonsensical and what everyone agrees to in the local area, then we're not going ever going to question that. And so we won't see the unseen. This is what you'd consider the autonomous model. And um, it's very Eurocentric, Eurocentric in many ways because in Canada, the reality is we have a lot of roots from European culture. And so we'll see these Euro views, or as some people would say, the white views, very easily, and we won't question them that way. But we have to move from that autonomous model to an ideological model. And in class, we kind of thought about that as two separate things, but I consider ideological kind of the umbrella over multiple autonomous views because the autonomous is the common sense. It's what you would do just without considering anything before the content. And so there would be different autonomous views for each local, but when you consider that ideological view, it's considering the person in the society first. It's considering the local values. And so you have to sit back and be teaching in kind of a discomfortable way at first. And you have to consider the surroundings you have. And once you get comfortable with that, then you can start going into more of the content. But you have to consider the student before the content in this idea. Now, Tyler's rationale. There's this man named Ralph Tyler who affected multiple generations of presidents because he was the influence in the states for education. He wasn't necessarily affiliated with one of the parties. He definitely had an affiliation in terms of like his own beliefs, but he was an influence for multiple presidents from different parties. And he made this rationale over time, and this is the fundamental aspect of schools now. It's what we all use. And it's not an all negative. The negative part of it is it starts with content. It's content focused. You don't consider the student first. You consider the purposes of school, so your outcomes. Then you move into the related experiences, which are your indicators. What means is it that we're going to use to prove the outcome was learned? Then it goes to the organization, which is for the first aspect where the student comes in, because this is how you transfer the information to the student. And then the evaluation slash assessment of the experiences are the end of that. So it's a very linear model, and it's very systematic and good that way. It's easy to implement. It works real well. But it's based in common sense ideas, because you start off with content, and when you start with content, you don't consider the student.
Another commonsensical idea that we kind of brushed on was the favorite students. And the I'm not saying, oh, oh you're bad if you uh, have a favorite student, but you have to remember, what does a favorite student mean? Why is someone your favorite student? Well, it either means that student fits the shape of society or it fits the shape that is your preferred shape in mind. So if the way you have to look at this is, again, don't look at the favorite student because that's a common sense idea. Look at what the bad student is in this case. Well, a bad student would be the student that doesn't necessarily follow your direction perfectly. It doesn't necessarily learn the same way that everyone else is learning. So it, they seem almost disruptive, but in reality, they're actually just not learning the same. And so when you pick your favorites, you're almost discriminating and oppressing that student that's not your favorite because they aren't fitting your commonsensical idea of education. So... The common sense ideas were kind of the biggest ideas during the semester and during like the entire dissection of curriculum. And there were other topics brushed on, but they all kind of fell into that idea that you are rooted with a common sense idea in your background. Your fight or flight mode will cause you to fall into this common sense idea, and all these different patterns will show up where they kind of connect to that common sense. So even though we discussed them in different ideas, we saw this common sense idea come back and back and back because that is a local concept. And if you bring that local concept to a different local and try to apply it, you're going to oppress that new community. But then we get into the resistance. How do you make a change on that? First of all, we have to remember learning is problematic. It has to be uncomfortable. If you do not have a problem, how are you going to actually have a solution and see a lesson from that? So we tend to try to unsee or we try to avoid the unseen. We don't want to go into those uncomfortable areas of education. But the idea is the only way to take care of those situations is to hit them head on. We have to go right into it, and we have to view it exactly how it is. And so this will create a problem. It will create discomfort. It's definitely not a fun situation for a teacher. But if we don't do that, we are just supporting the idea that the students have to become what society wants them to be. Whereas if we show this problem, if we show the discomfort that is there, um, it'll allow the students to see that and possibly become the resistance. They will have their own choice, whether they want to make change or become the change. And so an idea of this, or an example, this is Claire Kruger, how she had her um, teepee raising activity. And the curriculum, I mean, sorry, the government representatives actually asked her, is this a value? Is this worth money? Should we be funding this? And she actually stepped back for a moment to think about that because in some ways, common sense would say, no, this isn't a required activity. It's not part of curriculum, blah, 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 that type of thing. But then she actually realized, no, this is a significant activity, building relationships. And so it's important for us to go through. She also did a video session with her students, and there was at one point where they um, talked about how the indigenous peoples gave up their land. But in reality, they were supposed to share their land. So she used this as a lesson. She went back, changed the videos, it took a lot of time to change that. But this was a, an idea of a problem she ran into. It was a discomforting situation she fell into, and she learned from that. And she's using that for her learning now, and she's using it to teach others. There was also Gail Russell with her wonderful story time, but one of the biggest points that came out of her lecture and her ideas was that um, we are all mathematical beings, and you. everyone says math is unbiased, it's pure, it's nothing, but guess what? The minute you allow a student to say, oh, you're just an English student, or you're just a math student, or you're just not as good at math, you're allowing oppression to occur in your math class. Because math is oppressive when you approach it that way. Every single person can learn math. Everyone is a mathematical being. And the issues come in into the convention part, the commonsensical part, where we fall on conventions and that affects the students. So then the results. If we can follow this idea and work into the common sense idea, We'll be allowing our students to have a new identity, new relations, and new unity. So what I mean by this is they can choose their path. They can gain new relations through culture. And we can unify the country. Because unity isn't necessarily just everyone being European. Unity means everyone can equally be represented. So this is kind of my summary of learning. And um, 
yeah, it was a great semester.